turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter uh, 6. Uh, well, I do want to just to encourage you to come out on, on Sunday uh, evening. Of course, we'll have our Sunday morning service, but in, in the evening, we're going to have a baptism uh, and communion service. So we're going to have uh, that starting at 7 o'clock. Uh, hopefully, it's not going to be a- as hot as it is currently uh, right now, uh, but it's going to be 7 o'clock uh, outside. And what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, a couple songs. We'll ha- hear baptism testimonies, and then we'll have uh, baptisms outside uh, before we celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, so the whole service will probably be about 45 minutes uh, to, to an hour, but it's going to be a sweet time of, of fellowship, and then uh, we're going to encourage folks to kind of hang out uh, afterward and just uh, encourage uh, those who are baptized and as well just encourage uh, the church uh, family. Uh, well, it is a glorious day anytime we're in God's Word, uh, so let as, us be, as we begin, let us pray uh, so God uh, would be honored um, in this message. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your grace. Uh, I thank you so much that you are um, our Lord. You are our strength. You are our shield. You are the one who uh, protects us, who cares for us, who, who does all that you, you do to, to make sure that your name is glorified. God, I pray tonight as we study your word that you would speak. Uh, you would speak in a profound way. You give wisdom and insight to us tonight that you would be, make us aware of the schemes of the devils in our own heart, in our own lives, and in, in our church family. So, Father, we pray that now you would speak in such a powerful way uh, that you and your, your grace um, would help us love you more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are continuing our study uh, through uh, the book of Ephesians, so we pray this message tonight would be encouraging uh, uh, to you. Um, this is kind of uh, Paul's uh, ending. He's kind of landing the, the plane of, of this epistle. We've been in here for a while. Uh, this whole section is about um, uh, spiritual warfare, how we can stand in the Lord. Uh, but let's just kind of focus on the first three verses tonight. I'm going to read the entire passage for context, and then we'll dive in. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand, able to withstand in the evil day, and have done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all your circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. The words may be given to me in the opening my mouth, boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought uh, to speak." Uh, he begins this section by saying, finally, uh, be strong in the Lord. Uh, that's a kind of a, a reminder of almost the whole book. He's kind of like wrapping up this whole book. And if you just think about how this book is, is written, at the beginning, he talks about your, your salvation in Christ is by Christ and his grace alone. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 is all about the magnificence of God's grace in salvation, that he does it completely and fully. And we say amen. Chapters 4 through 6 is really about God's sanctifying work in the Spirit. And let us not forget chapter 1 through 3, that all your sanctification is done by the same spirit of grace that God saves with. So we are not saved by grace and then work in the flesh. He makes the same point in Galatians. We are saved in the spirit, by the spirit, then we are called to walk in the spirit by the power of the spirit. So when it says, finally, be strong in the Lord, what he's reminding us is that you need to, to stand in the strength that the Lord has already given you. You don't need to kind of fight in your own power to be holy and to be righteous. No, you need to work, but you need to work within God's power. Our salvation unites us to Christ. Our sanctification is completed by Christ. And we need to remember who God is. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Uh, I remember when I was a young sixth grader, um, I had aspirations to be a football star even then. Uh, And I remember going in the back and in in our, behind our house was a school, Lincoln Elementary School, in a giant field uh, out there. I went to play with my brother's friends. 
Now, my uh, oldest brother is three years older than me, and one of his friends was a guy named Russo. I don't remember his first name. I just remember Russo, right? And I was a, a spry, a 12-year-old going after this behemoth of a man, and I said, I'm going to knock him down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to knock Russo down. And I, I charged Russo in this game of, of tackle football. And uh, I, I remember running at him full speed, and then I remember flying the, in the opposite direction, <laughs> landed on the ground and banged my head against the rock and went home crying, right? Um, my dreams of being a football star did not start well. But this is who God is. God is like the Russo, right? See, our, our evil, the evil that's kind of coming at us is like a 12-year-old me. We're running at it as fast as we can, but once it stands against the strength of Almighty God, it is thrown back, falls, bangs her head, and runs away crying. And I think sometimes we forget of the power and the majesty of Almighty God. God is glorious in his power and his strength. So when we stand against all the forces of darkness against us, as we will look at, we stand with God, who is powerful than all. So I pray that we would understand that we need to be strong in the Lord, knowing that the Lord is strong. This is why we can stand with him. But notice what he keeps on. He goes on and says, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Uh, now, we are so familiar with that language, put on the full armor of God. If you've been raised in church, this is a passage that many of you know. But just look, understand this. What is the armor of God? Well, what do you put armor on for? For, for war. The Christian life is a war. We, we are in, in, in a battle right now against the evil one and the forces of, of darkness. You know, we'll talk in the coming weeks what this full armor is as we kind of read, read it today. Uh, but just understand that this war is a battle. And I don't think it's hard right now to see that war is a battle. It seems like everywhere we look, we see a battle raging right? We see a battle raging uh, on the two political spectrums. We see a battle raging on, on, on social media. We see a battle raging on, uh, on, with all the different opinions uh, of COVID-19 and how we should handle this. It's not hard to see, but I think sometimes we, we forget that the Christian life really is a battle, that there is a, a, an enemy that is, is trying to wage war against your soul. And, and beloved, it's not just raging war against you. It's raging war against the brothers and sisters who are in this room. This is why God calls us together to be part of a local body is because there's sometimes that we're strong and we're fighting the war, but the person next to us is weak and wounded. What do they need? They need the body of Christ. They need someone to come alongside them and maybe take, take a bullet, maybe to pull them up and, and, and help, them, help them run and finish the race. This is what we're called to, right? And, and parents, guess what? There is an enemy going after the souls and, and hearts of your children, right? And I think one of the, the schemes, as we'll think about here in a second, of the evil one, is he wants you to lull you to sleep to make you think that life really isn't a war. Because if we thought life was a war, what would happen when we face trials and difficulties? We would expect it because we would know that life is a war. But what typically happens when we face trials? We can tend to get discouraged, frustrated, and we tend to want to give up and shrink. But listen, beloved, we are in a war. This is why we need to be strong for that war. But remember, the war that we are in, we are not in it alone. We are with God. The, the God who left heaven, who came to us, died for our sins, was dead and buried, was raised from the dead, is set into the right hand of God, and sent his Holy Spirit to be ever living with us. We are not alone. We have God with us, always. Jesus says, go and make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I've commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God has given us a war. The war is to make disciples for his name, and he's going to be with us. But we don't just have the Lord. What do we have? We have one another. We really have one another. We have to lean into one another, into the body of, of Christ. Beloved, we are not at peacetime. We are at war. So we put this whole armor of God on. We think when we are prepared for a battle, we put the whole armor of God on. It's not just one piece. Uh, can you imagine in, in the old days going out to war without your gun, going out to war without your sword? Well, you're not going to do that. that that's, that's foolish. I mean, you've probably watched a football game and seen someone run out into the field without their helmet, and we all go, <laughs> silly little guy who's 300 pounds that could squash us like a bug, right? He, but he needs his helmet. He can't go on the field without his helmet. We're preparing for battle. We have to be prepared. So this is the, the whole idea of putting on the whole armor of God, which we'll talk about here in a second. But then he says this, the reason why we do that, that, the purpose, that you may be able to stand against the schemes 
of the devil. I don't know how often you do this, how often you just think, okay, how is the devil trying to get me today? How is the devil working in my life now to deceive me, to subtly shift me off course? You know, the, the very rarely does the devil kind of come like the, the, kind of like the monologue with the, with the evil villain in those movies, right? Where the evil villain is, captures the, the, her, the hero and it starts telling all that he was going to do. I was going to do this and I was going to do that. And then all of a sudden, the hero is freed and saves the day. Well, guys, the devil's not going to tell you how he's going to come at you, right? He doesn't really have a whole lot of tactics, right? Go back to the garden, right? He's got a, he, got, he comes at you the same way every time, but he just disguises it. He makes it look different every single time, and yet it's really the same tactics. He's going after your flesh. He's going after the lust of your eyes. He's going after your pride and your lust for power. The devil is a scheming, schemer, and he's coming after us, and we have to be aware of it. You know, uh, there's great books that maybe help, help you see this. I think one of the, the best is The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. If you've read that, it's, 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 it's a, a senior demon kind of writing to a younger demon how to kind of thwart his, his subject or his, his enemy. Um, and, and I guess if, if there was a, a, a demon in your life, like a senior demon, like The Screwtape Letters, going after you, how would they attack you? How, how would they, they, they make you off course? Some of you, it could be they could tempt you with the love of money. I mean, they could, they could offer you a position that's going gonna, gonna to make have you make lots of money, right? But it's going to be also take you, make you work lots of hours and take you away from your family and the Word of God in the church. That could be a temptation for, for you. It could be bitterness. You could be tempted personally with bitterness. You could, when someone slights you or says something mean to you, you can, you can be welled up in bitterness against someone. Right, there's, we all have individual schemes in our life, but here's the deal. When we have these individual schemes, we may not always see it, right? We may be blind to it, but the devil's going after you right now, and you have weak spots. I have weak spots. Every single one of us in this room has weak spots, right? This is why God says, get in a family. Get in the body of Christ, because you need people to help you with your weak spots, because we all have them. So how are you wired? Where are you tempted? This is one of the reasons why I, I say often, and I said it a couple weeks ago, invite people into your life to rebuke you and to warn you. Is there anything in my life that would cause you concern? Do you feel that I'm, I'm, I'm subtly being deceived or manipulated by the evil one, right? And when we have that humility, we may be aware. Now, when we are affected individually, right, and we're not protecting ourselves individually, what's going to happen? We are individually affected, and then we are affect, that affects our, our, our spouses, if you're married. It affects your, your children. Then it affects the, the larger body of, of Christ. You know, Satan very rarely tries to make you, his main attack is usually not against God. Because if, if God came to our life as Christians, we, we, well, we don't believe that. The Bible says this. Where, where Satan typically attacks the church is horizontally in our relationships. He tries to throw strife or division or dissension in the body of Christ, right? And when that happens, that's when we start to, be, our relationship with the Lord starts to be affected, okay? He doesn't go after him first, but he goes after him by going after us. And if we're fighting, guess what's going to happen? The world's not going to see a true picture of the gospel, and they're not going to want God. So how we handle ourselves with each other, how we handle ourselves in the public sphere, whether that's online or at work, is a picture to the, with the, with the gospel of Christ. And if we're not handling ourselves well there, we are following into the temptation of the evil one. So you, you see how a marriage may be destroyed, right? Not maybe at the beginning of their marriage, but maybe something that happened when they were 11 and 12 being introduced to pornography, and how pornography is just that consistent struggle in their life that eventually at 25, at 30, at 40, and ends up destroying a marriage, right? Satan plays the long game, right? He's subtle. He's trying to not just have you struggle with one thing. He wants to have your life destroyed and your soul go to hell. That's the, the war that we're in. I mean, it could be as simple as sports. And sports, before you know it, start taking over the Lord's Day. The Lord says in his word that Sunday is the Lord's day. And we may subtly become, hey, there's a, there's a tournament, then there's three tournaments, and then, hey, my kid has a chance for a scholarship. 
You know, it could be focusing on the implication of the gospel, not the gospel itself. It could be where, where Christians are trying to bind the conscience of other Christians when the Word of God does not do so. It could be that our society is struggling is because we don't like to read. And we're so driven by images and phones and screens is that we can't read. Our attention spans are so short that we can't listen to a sermon for 30 minutes. We can't read a passage of Scripture for 10 minutes. Why? It's because we have trained ourselves by the world's ways. It's a scheme. It's a scheme of the evil one. One of the things I often is asked myself as, a, as, a, as the elder pastor of Park Baptist Church is where are the schemes of the devil in Park Baptist Church? Where are the potential places where the devil can kind of swoop in to our body? I mean, it, I mean, it could be right now that there's a potential issue of mask or no mask, right? And that, that mask or no mask could come into a, a dissension among the, the leadership of, of the church. We don't trust the leaders of the body because they're not caring for a certain segment of our, of our body. Now, that's not saying that we're, we're not doing things perfectly, right? We could, we could be, you know, we, we, what, what did I just say? We're doing things perfectly, I think is what I just said. No, we're not doing things perfectly. Oh, no, that's not, you, can, you can bring up concerns to your leaders. That's not what I'm saying. But what, what could easily happen is that you could fall on two sides of the camp and then throw shots in your heart against your leaders. And then you don't have, you're not called to submit to your authorities. You're called to rebel against them. That's what's happening in your heart. That could happen. Or it could happen where you see someone post something online and you are, you are angry at that person, right? You're condemning them. You're judging them, right? Rather than talking to them and loving them right? That could be a scheme that the other evil one is trying to do. But listen, he doesn't do it so that you will react something on Tuesday that you will react on Saturday. He does it on, in January. He does it in March. He does it in, what's the next one? Right? He does it in May, right? So that in, in, in December, your relationship with this person is affected. Because when relationships cool, right? When affections are cool, well, then we're not loving each other the way Christ loves us. It's a scheme of the evil one. Listen, I mean, have you, have you just asked where are the potential schemes where we could be divisive in the body? Because the devil's always working. And as elders, our job is to teach the word of God in, in a very pure fashion, the best we, we know how, but also to protect the flock. And if there's things that we're not doing that we need to be doing, let us know. But usually our if we're all do, taking care of ourselves individually first, then we're going to be all right corporately. And then look what it says here, uh, the real battle. Verse, verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Uh, we don't know exactly what all he's talking about there, but we probably think that rulers and authorities are, are some sort of hierarchy of, of evil uh, spirits that Satan uses to, to do his, his will. Uh, cosmic powers of this present darkness, maybe worldly philosophies or things that are kind of in uh, the worldly system that stands against uh, Christ. Spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places could be referring to overt um, perversion of, of, of truth expressed in hatred and venom in uh, violence against individuals? We don't really know, but we, we do know that the real battle is not the person across from you. The real battle is not your spouse. The real battle is not your children. The real battle is not your, your boss or your coworker. The real battle is, is, the, evil, is the evil one. You know, I, I, 2 Timothy uh, chapter um, 4 Sorry, chapter 2, verse 24 is a wonderful verse to remind us of, of what we're facing, okay? So let me read the whole, whole little section. It says, So flee, yourself, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with all, so, all those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Then he says this, The Lord's servant... Now, he's speaking primarily to Timothy, understanding as a leader, but I think this applies to all Christians. If you are the Lord's servant, you must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. So there's a character quality of all Christians. And he says this, God may perhaps grant them, those who are against us, right, repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, 
after being captured by him to do his will. So right now, the evil one is trying to capture people to do his will, that to make people stand against Christ. And we get in trouble because we don't see the schemes of the evil one, and we don't see that these are spiritual forces of darkness in, in the spiritual realm, and we start attacking a person who's right in front of us. We can't do that. Because when we do, we're being captured by the evil one to do his will. We're bringing strife and dissension towards our spouse. We're not caring for our, our friends. I mean, just, this, just, just think for a second in, in your own mind, how many times have you been offended in the last month from someone who shared an opinion that was different than you just on COVID-19 stuff? Now, the person who offended you, did you pray for them? Did you love them? Did you try to serve them? Or did you just kind of withdraw from them? Well, if you started to withdraw from them, guess what, beloved? You may be falling into the scheme of the evil one. You know, I try to have, have issues in my own life, try, how I try to fight against my own, my own issues, my own schemes um, with people, is that when I am offended by someone, I'm hurt by someone, typically what I try to do is I try to move closer to them because I want to love them. I, my natural in my flesh is to do what? I don't need that. But I, after I kind of get over my, 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 my own fleshly battle, then I lean into that person, I try to love them. And guess what? My relationship with that person improves. Let's not be unwise. Let's understand what our true enemy is. Our true enemy is not people. Lastly, what does he says in verse 13? Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. You see that again, the whole armor of God taken up twice, right? We need all this armor, right? And again, you'll see this as it's played out. The whole armor of God is not only you individually, but it's the corporate body of Christ, right? God has not given you everything and every gift and talent. God has given the body of Christ all those things, and you need the whole body of Christ. That purpose, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Uh, first, let me say just a couple things as, as I close, is that you need to understand that you need to have humility for the fight. You know, I think that we've seen in our own congregation that you need to be aware that any one of us is, is susceptible to sin. We need to have a humility about the, the dangers in our own life. I mean, just look at the different folk, folks in the scriptures. You have Harminius and Alexander that Paul mentions to Timothy. They had to be expelled from the church. Most scholars think that they were elders, leaders in the church. Right? Paul says Alexander the coppersmith. Maybe been the same Alexander has, has it did him great harm. You know, we see Demas, right? Demas, who in love with the world deserted the apostle Paul, right? And how many countless others that were, were looking at the risen Christ and walked away and rejected him. When Jesus said, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be my disciples. And people said they heard that word and many turned away. They saw Jesus, physically saw Jesus and turned away. We have to be aware, therefore we have to fight in the Lord's power. We have to, to gird ourselves up daily in prayer, in the, in the spirit, in the word of God, uh, with the people of God to fight against the schemes of the devil. And we need to ask people in our life, where am I falling astray? Because we don't see it ourselves. And our isolation, I think this is one of the schemes of the evil one, what he's doing right now in our world is he's making people more isolated. We're, the more isolated we become, the, the, more, the more in danger that we are. I mean, how many times have you seen a pack of, of uh, wolves being attacked? You don't really see a pack of wolves being attacked. But do you see one by himself out in the field? Well, that's when they're going to be attacked. Beloved, we need to resist the devil. Stand firm and he will flee from you. James says that, right? Uh, the devil's going to come at us, right? And we're going to see with the whole armor of God how we take a stand against the devil. Uh, but listen, you may not have all the conversations that I have with people in the body of Christ about their struggles and about their pain, but listen, there's a lot of attacks going on in the body of Christ right now. The schemes of the devil are, are active in the people's lives at Park Baptist Church. By God's grace, I think right now, corporately, I think that we are very unified. 
I am very encouraged by the spiritual maturity I've seen in the church uh, over the last month, right? I think that we have turned a corner in the midst of all this COVID stuff. Two months ago, I was, I was concerned, but I think God has really done a work in us, right? But individually, people are hurting, and we have to take our eyes off of ourselves and really lean into one another, right? Because guess what? We need people to lean into us, to help us stand firm and resist the evil one. Uh, and we, we know that our God has already defeated the evil one. It was promised in Genesis chapter 3 that God was going to send the seed of Adam to, to crush the serpent's head. Well, the, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus have, has crushed the serpent's head. Well, let us just stand firm in that truth. Father, I thank you for Christ. Uh, I thank you for the power of the gospel. We pray that you help us live in light of that truth. Lord, help us stand against the devil's schemes, putting on the full armor of God. Uh, I pray that we would be aware uh, and that we would understand that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Uh, therefore, we would stand in the grace of the spirit of the Lord Jesus that you've given us. Uh, it's in his name we pray. Amen.